Live from KSAT 12, the 6 o'clock news starts right now. Accept and embrace the new technology. That is the message for attorneys from State Senator Judith Zaffarini during a Zoom seminar she hosted today. Our Paul Venema sat in on that seminar and then talked to the senator about her impressions concerning the impact the pandemic is having on the court system. I'm delighted to welcome you to our Zoom meeting titled The Pandemic's Permanent Impact on Texas Courtrooms. Joining the senator was David Slayton of the State Office of Court Administration and Justice Rebecca Martinez from the Fourth Court of Appeals. The hour-long training session was primarily designed to assist attorneys as they navigate the remote court proceedings dictated by the pandemic. Her prediction? They're here to stay in some form. I believe that simply because of popularity and because of convenience that more judges, more attorneys, and more clients will want more virtual hearings. She said virtual hearings have also increased participation. Among the downsides of the pandemic, she said, is the backlog created in the absence of jury trials. There's no way that the number of cases can be moved with the same speed and efficiency that they were before. And actually, there was a backlog in many courts before the pandemic. So the pandemic has really exacerbated it. For the immediate future, expect plexiglass barriers, face coverings, and social distancing to be what she said is part of the new normal. Paul Venom, a case at 12 News. As the nation mourns the passing of Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, the stage is now set for the confirmation of President Donald Trump's nominee. The president has promised it will be another woman, but a conservative one, unlike Justice Ginsburg. Jesse DeGriotto now with what a 6-3 conservative majority could mean for issues championed by many liberals. Having lost Ruth Bader Ginsburg, a liberal icon of the high court, following a period of mourning, U.S. Supreme Court justices will begin hearing cases next month. The Affordable Care Act said to be the highest profile case on the docket. Congress had eliminated the penalty on healthy people if they didn't enroll. That's gone from the statute. Does that mean that the entire statute is unconstitutional or only part of the statute? What if, as predicted, President Trump nominates another conservative for Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell to bring to a vote? This is not as likely to raise the kinds of conservative liberal differences that the public often sees in the Supreme Court. Yet there's still DACA and potentially other issues still to come, such as abortion and the environment. The chances of those undergoing major changes, he says, are small. The Supreme Court in most circumstances is conservative in the sense of not trying radically to reshape society. Although Professor Aaron says it's possible there won't be any radical changes in existing laws, people who could be affected will likely still be following the high court's decisions in the future. Jesse De Goyado, KSAT 12 News. New details tonight on a shooting at a West Side strip mall that ended with one man dead. The Bear County Medical Examiner's Office identifying the victim as 20 year old Miguel Carvajal Jr. The shooting happened around 645 last night in the 9800 block of Petrenko. Police telling us that officers found Carvajal dead behind the wheel of his car and multiple shell casings nearby. Surveillance video shows a man driving away from the scene in a dark colored SUV shortly after that shooting. Right now, police are still searching for the person responsible. There are still a lot of details to be sorted out in the case of Victor Sanchez, a 44 year old man shot dead by San Antonio police officers last night. Officers were responding to the northwest side apartment complex where Sanchez lived for reports of a burglary. But the mother of Sanchez's son, who is inside, says he interpreted all knocks heard around the home as threats and figured one gunshot into the ground to scare away the possible intruders was what he would do. Then she says he told her and the kids to run outside. Investigators say officers tried to get Sanchez to drop the gun, but he pointed it at them and threatened them with a rifle. Six officers then shot him. His family says he may have been suffering a mental health episode yesterday. They are now wishing things had played out differently. What if your wife or your husband had a mental issue? Did you, would you expect for the cops to come over here and then just start firing and killing, killing your loved one? 
This and another shooting where a man was killed by San Antonio police just over a week ago have led to family members of deceased calling for police body camera footage to be released. While Police Chief William McManus has vowed to renew, excuse me, to review the footage in each case, no word on if and when it will be released. San Antonio Police and Crime Stoppers asking for your help tracking down the people responsible for the death of 36 year old Crystal Holland. She was shot and killed on September 9th while outside a home in the 500 block of Ferris Avenue. Police say the shooter drove by firing multiple times. Although there were witnesses around at the time of the shooting, none provided information to police. Anyone who does have information is urged to call Crime Stoppers at 210-224-STOP. A family of five, including a one year old, making it out safely from a house fire on the south side overnight. That fire broke out about 2 a.m. in the home on Ann Arbor Drive, not far from South Zarzamora Street and Loop 410. Fire crews able to quickly put out the flames. However, one firefighter suffered a medical issue. The battalion chief says he was evaluated at a nearby hospital. Fire officials believe the flames sparked in a dryer. The home was significantly damaged. The pandemic has created chaos for school students of all ages, including those applying to college. With SAT and ACT testing centers closed or altered for COVID regulations, colleges are making some big changes. Many across the country have waived test score requirements as part of their application process. Courtney Friedman tells us how both public and private colleges are handling admissions and scholarships. SAT and ACT scores are a big part of the college admissions process, but COVID has upended testing for many students. So many universities are responding by making it optional. We started seeing students having challenges getting into um, testing locations. We made the decision to, to waive the test score requirement for the remainder of last, last year's uh, cycle. So that really benefited a lot of students. Lynn Barnes is the senior vice provost for UTSA's administration strategic enrollment and says that change has been extended for the next application cycle. So, you know, we're just trying to be as flexible as possible. And a lot of my colleagues across the state and, and throughout the nation are doing the exact same thing. Trinity University Dean of Admissions Justin Doty says back in April they created a test optional policy for admissions and scholarships for the next three years. We tend to place more emphasis on the cumulative GPA combined with how rigorous a student's chosen curriculum is in high school. Barnes says right now the same is true for UTSA, but they're still developing that new scholarship process. Either way, Barnes and Doty give the same advice for students and parents. Over communicate. Keep contacting colleges in advance to find out their current protocol. This is a fluid situation, so there's no telling when things will go back to normal. But I will say both of the leaders I spoke to today say there is a nationwide discussion about whether standardized tests should be involved in the admissions process at all. In the newsroom, Courtney Friedman, KSAT 12 News. New at six, a familiar name, Greg Brockhouse, once again taking on Mayor Ron Nuremberg, this time in opposition to a pair of sales tax initiatives on the November ballot. The former city councilman and mayoral challenger tells our Garrett Berger he doesn't think citizens are getting the full story. People don't have information. They don't know what's going on. This is about getting data and information out. Greg Brockhouse is wading into the debate on two tax proposals for workforce development and transportation. Tens of millions of dollars in new tax programs. These are new taxes. The proposals on the November ballot wouldn't change the current tax rate. They would use the same one eighth of a cent sales tax at different times and only after the current use for aquifer protection and developing linear Creekway parks expires. But Brockhouse says a new use is a new tax. A vote no is a tax decrease in the sales tax. The first time that's happened in decades. Brockhouse says he wants to put together a team and give people facts on the proposed tax initiatives. In question, for example, how a future workforce development program helps people now. You've got people out of work at every level of our economy, right? Right now. Brockhouse, who has a mayoral candidate, said he would bring a vote to city council to increase funding to VIA, says for now he doesn't think the transit agency needs additional dollars. And voting for them shouldn't happen years in advance. I think you can go around this city and see empty buses everywhere. I think they need to be smarter with the dollars they have, and they need to utilize and fill the buses they have now. 
Brockhouse is framing his efforts not as a typical campaign, but as that of a private citizen exercising his First Amendment rights. This is me out there building my own group, capitalizing on my own social media reach and, like I said, contact databases and stuff like that. He plans to host a town hall on October 6th. Garrett Berger, KSAT 12 News. We contacted the campaigns for both sales tax initiatives. A strategist for the campaign in favor of the tax for transportation funding noted that Brockhouse's previous support for funding via and also said, quote, I think now we are voting on a plan to fully fund via and I would hope that he would agree that that's in line with his goals and he would be supportive of that, end quote. While the campaign for the tax to fund the workforce development program said in part, quote, over 150,000 San Antonians lost their jobs as a result of COVID-19 and tens of thousands of our neighbors are still struggling to put food on the table. These families do not deserve opposition or obstructions, but they deserve a chance to thrive in the city they call home, end quote. Check out live cam right now. We have just dipped below 80 degrees, but I really am enjoying September so far. It's been nice to us. It's given us some rain and temperatures. Well, just, even just over the past five days, the highs have been below average. We're starting to clear out out there. Aquifer, not a big change today. It's pretty much the same as yesterday. Pollen count, ragweed's moderate, mold on the low end. We topped out at 83 today. That's five degrees below the average high temperature and the record being 99. Right now, for the most part, we're hovering around 80 locally, but even warmer west of town. Hondo up to 88, but 78 in New Braunfels. Potential cold front to talk about coming up. New cases of COVID-19 this evening, which brings our total to 53,794 since this began. Our seven-day moving average now is 148 cases per day. Uh, fortunately and gratefully, we have no new deaths to report tonight. So uh, again, keep those who we have lost and their families in your prayers. Also, we do uh, want to report uh, we are continuing to uh, see those numbers stabilize in the hospitals. We are down five from yesterday, so 228 uh, patients uh, in the hospital this evening. Our total percentage of positive ca cases in the hospital is 6%. There are 30 new COVID-related admissions, admissions in the hospital overnight. That's down six from yesterday. And we have 87 patients in the ICU and 41 patients on ventilators. So it looks like we are plateauing a bit on those uh, cases. Uh, but again, we're watching those numbers because this week is where we see the results from our Labor Day weekend. The Parks and Recreation Department, I do want to inform you, is also offering students free access to our virtual learning hubs at eight community centers, and that begins on October 5th. The virtual learning hubs will be open Monday through Friday from 7.30 a.m. to 4 p.m. And uh, why are they called virtual learning hubs? Well, they provide internet access and free lunch to students ages six and up in elementary, middle, and high school. Students and staff will follow the COVID-19 health and safety protocols, such as health screenings, temperature checks, as well as wearing face masks uh, daily. Uh, they'll also be physically distanced and frequently hand washing. So online registration for those virtual learning hubs open today at six o'clock. And so you can visit saparksandrec.com for more information on those virtual learning hubs. Let me turn it over to Judge Wolf. Yeah, thanks, and, and things are continuing to look better. It's a little too early to break out the champagne, but you might can take a little sip or two. Uh, one number that looked good to me today was the fact that people that come out to the Freeman Coliseum, which is our major testing site, it's one of the lowest I've ever seen was 150 some odd people. And these are people that have symptoms that come. So it may be a good, may be a good sign, but one day doesn't uh, cure everything, but it looks, numbers are certainly looking good. That was a more than a bit disappointed um, when I read about the fact that the chair of the Texas Republican Party, who was just elected, Alan West and the Agriculture Commissioner, Sid Miller, along with some state senators and representatives, uh, filed a lawsuit against uh, Governor Abbott. I mean, this is probably the most stinking thing I've seen so far coming out of the right wing of the party. Governor Abbott you know, we don't agree on everything, and we certainly have disagreed with him on face mask and others, but uh, he has stood up. He's trying to protect people, and he did that with giving us six extra days to, for the early vote from October the 13th to the 19th. Uh, they're filing a lawsuit to turn that over, 
and take that authority away from him and say that he had no right to do that. There are several reasons why he did that. Uh, number one, we're going to have a huge vote, and those six extra days are going to be important. But he's protecting people by doing that. He's protecting our judges by doing that, by not having a massive turnout on one day. Uh, so I, it's just very, very disappointing uh, that that's happening, uh, and that's happening to him, because I think he stood up. He's done some things I know that have been controversial within his party, and I do uh, thank him for doing that and thank him for doing the right thing. And everything we're doing, we're trying to save lives and trying to keep people from any, ending up in the hospital. And uh, so hopefully they will lose that case and uh, be over with. Uh, I mentioned, I think it was uh, a couple of days ago, that we're having this uh, giving free uh, flu shots on the 26th of uh, of uh, this month, which is this coming Saturday. I think it starts at 9 o'clock and goes all day. I'll be out there at 10 o'clock, and I think Commissioner Justin Rodriguez is coming out. And we've had 3,000 people already sign up uh, to get their flu shot. So we need to think about having more of those. I know the city's working on some. Uh, but the more people that can get that flu shot, it's going to help us get through a very difficult season where we're having flu with COVID uh, laying on top of it. So uh, we'll work about trying to maybe get another one to go in, too. Thanks. Okay. Great. Thank you, Judge. And and we know uh, lots of folks are out, are struggling right now through this pandemic. I want you to know there's uh, assistance opportunities available if you need help with a mortgage or rent, uh, food assistance, any type of assistance that you might need, you can find, and the city and the county are working together to provide it. You can go to the website at covid19.sanantonio.gov to find more information about those assistance programs. If you are out of a job, have lost income, and would like to be part of our training program, Program that will give you a stipend in order to make ends meet, as well as uh, put food on the table and, and keep that rent check going. Uh, you can sign up for the training program by calling 210-224-HELP. All right, the mayor there talking about the resources still available for people who are uh, still suffering during this pandemic. He mentioned tonight that the numbers in the hospital continue to stabilize. 228 people hospitalized with COVID tonight. 155 new cases reported today, but no new deaths reported this evening. Yeah, it all looks good. As a matter of fact, County Judge Nelson Wolf with perhaps the quote of this briefing saying it's not time to break out the champagne yet, but maybe take a sip or two shows you that they're feeling very good about where the numbers are right now. We're in the time frame where we should be seeing any increase if there is one from what happened on Labor Day. And so it's a good thing that things continue to trend downward. Meanwhile, trending downwards, our temperature has been. But, you know, are we getting hit by a cold front here in a few days? Well, a a legitimate cold front? It, not a few days. It'd be about this time next week. OK, so right. I know people hear that word and they think, oh, well, tomorrow morning we wake up to no, 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 no. It's not that situation. <laughs> OK, it'd be about this time next week when we could feel the effects of a fall like cold front. Yeah, next they're going to be asking you about snow. Of course, <laughs> you said it. Now you said it. it see, no zero. I mean, chance. not me. You know, Doesn't those matter. people will be zero not me. chance. Zero, <laughs> zero. <laughs> okay, let's get right to it. Take a look at our sky that's clearing out there. The clouds are slowly pushing off to the east and our sky is clearing out this evening. The rain you see in Louisiana, that's the remnants of what was once tropical storm beta. Now a lot of moisture just rain with it, remnant low as it moves across the Mississippi into the southeastern United States. We did pick up a little bit of rain from it, but most of it, of course, was around Houston, where they had issues of flash flooding. 79 right now, dew point is 65, north northeasterly breeze at 9. I think that wind this evening is going to settle down and pretty much be calm later tonight. Big temperature difference out there right now. 77 LaGrange in Victoria, 84 Pleasanton, then you get into the lower 90s in Del Rio at 92 along with Catula because of the clouds off to the east and total sunshine farther to the west. That's why we have the big range in temperatures, but we're all feeling a bit of humidity in the air with dew points in the 60s. Comfortable this evening, partly cloudy, a calm wind, 
76 at 8 p.m. by 10 p.m. 72. We'll start the day tomorrow at 66, then make it up, I think, in the mid to upper 80s for high temperatures. And it's going to be a fairly sunny day. And then sunshine is going to be really the rule for the rest of the work week on into the upcoming weekend. And even as we go into the early part of next week, minimal rain chances. We're talking a 10% chance here and there. That would be Sunday and then Tuesday, Wednesday. Tuesday, Wednesday would be a result of that potential cold front, which could really knock down temperatures again after this little warming trend we're going to experience and that would be nice thanks adam all right this is a guy who seems like he's making up for lost time greg now you what's interesting about kellen mon here is lost time would be the fact that they haven't been able to get close to winning the sec championship and on for kellen mon this is the season to do it because this is his senior season when we come back what does he have to say about that and how do the Longhorns react to the fact Texas Tech is limiting their fans to just 25% capacity for their game coming up? The undefeated UTSA Roadrunners have faced winless Middle Tennessee Blue Raiders this Friday night in the Alamo Dome to open Conference USA play. It's an opponent that was secured last Saturday when Memphis had to bow out due to positive coronavirus tests. Roadrunners are hoping more fans will come out after just over 6,600 fans made it to their home opener against Stephen F. Austin when they can have just over 11,000 in attendance during the COVID-19 pandemic. I understand it's a pandemic, so uh, everybody will be more spread out and not that many people are going to go. It's kind of quiet at times, uh, but like Coach said, we got to bring our own juice on the sideline, uh, just get motivated by ourselves. Uh, but we appreciate all the fans that came out, and uh, we understand that some fans don't want to come out because of the pandemic, uh, but we just appreciate the support and uh, just come out again Friday and get it rocking. After being injured the last two seasons, Frank says he's taking nothing for granted this year. Kickoff on Friday except for 7 p.m. As former Reagan, now Aggie quarterback Kellen Mond prepares to start his final season at Texas A&M. He's just on about every watch list there is, from Maxwell to Manning. He's also close to setting a number of Aggie records in passing yardage, attempts, completions, and touchdowns. The one thing that has not happened for Mond or the Maroon and White since joining the SEC in 2012 is winning the conference championship. So what has changed for Mond going into his senior season? Evaluating myself, you know, throughout this whole entire offseason, throughout quarantine, um, you know, I looked over through every single play that I ever uh, ran in my junior year. Um, and I just wanted to evaluate myself and find out what I could do better and figure out the best way to, you know, um, basically improve myself. And um, so I, I'm just, you know, this year I'm on a mission and um, not only for myself, but for my teammates. And I just want to be a great leader and take them to higher levels. And Mon says he never considered opting out this season. Kickoff against Vanderbilt on Saturday set for 630. The Peanut Butter Bowl is back this season. This year will involve actually four games. Churchill versus Alamo Heights on October the 1st. Seguin against New Braunfels on October the 2nd. Brennan versus Reagan on October 17th. And Johnson against Brandeis on October 22nd. Fans are being asked to bring a jar of peanut butter to the game that will be donated to Snack Pack for Kids San Antonio, Christian Cupboard, or SOS Food Bank. Or you can click on PayPal and donate by credit card. We're doing something that's bigger than us. And we're trying to always tell our student athletes you know, it's, it's about others. It's about doing something with good for the team, what's good for your community. It's a great opportunity for them to get outside themselves and promote uh, for a worthy cause. They understand the things that are going on in today's world. They're, they're, they're very empathetic to it. So for them to have a reason to play uh, more than just for playing for themselves and their, their community, it's pretty important for them. Just a, a great opportunity for our young kids to see what it's like to give back and to be that servant leader that we always talk about. And the University of Houston has had another season opener postponed this time with North Texas. As after the Mean Green revealed four positive coronavirus tests on the team and the subsequent contact tracing left North Texas unable to field a team for this game. This is the fourth season opener that has been postponed or canceled due to the COVID-19 pandemic for the University of Houston that struck Rice, Memphis, Baylor, and now North Texas. They can't get a game yet. I, you know what? I think there's some teams that, I mean... It's just going to happen throughout the year. And look what happens in high school football where this team from Virginia is flying all the way to San Antonio to play Steel on Friday night. How about fun. that? Yeah. yeah. Greg Simmons Airways is what I heard. <laughs> yes, I'm sure they <laughs> would trust that. <laughs> Thanks, Greg. We'll be right back.
An officer has been indicted in the Brianna Taylor case six months after her death at the hands of Louisville police who were executing a warrant. But as CNN's Daryl Forges reports, the Kentucky Attorney General's decision to only level charges against one of the officers involved is not the outcome many were hoping for. After months of mounting pressure, no justice, no peace. a grand jury has announced three charges of wanton endangerment against Brett Hankinson, one of the officers involved in the March shooting death of Breonna Taylor. The grand jury voted to return an indictment against Detective Hankinson for three counts of wanton endangerment for wantonly placing the three individuals in apartment three in danger of serious physical injury or death. The charge of one endangerment in the first degree is a class D felony and if found guilty, the accused can serve up to five years for each count. Hankison, fired from the force in June, is one of the three officers investigated by the attorney general, but is the only officer who has been indicted by a grand jury. For those fighting for justice, these charges may not be enough. The decision comes on the heels of a historic wrongful death lawsuit settlement. The city of Louisville agreeing to both pay $12 million to the family Brianna Taylor and institute sweeping police reforms. It is landmark in its scope. The 26-year-old EMT and aspiring nurse was killed back on March 13th when Louisville Metro Police executed a late-night warrant and a narcotics investigation. Taylor's death at the hands of police adding to the resounding calls for justice and accountability. Taylor's mother vows to fight until justice is done for her daughter. I'll fight to the death of me for, for her. In Louisville, Kentucky, I'm Daryl Ford reporting. All right, outside today, we're 79 right now. Some clouds seem to be giving us a bit of a break. Yeah, there. got some clouds, not a lot of any rain right now. And, you know, we're always ready for rain. Yep, we are. And I wish we had better rain chances, but Steve was on his level five listening earlier. <laughs> and really no good prospect of rain on Friday, yeah. right? Yeah, unfortunately. All right, but we do have a <laughs> prospect of a cold. Front. I didn't know. I didn't know we had levels of listening. We I appreciate five. that. I appreciate that. I'm level five. Mm -hmm. All right, that we learned means, about that today. Yep, you picked up on it. That's good. All right, let's get right to it. Yes, I do. <laughs> I want to take a look at the aquifer. This is since June 1st, and looking at especially the 10-day average there, it's up to 663.9, which is good because that pulls us out of stage one restrictions, but, but we still are within stage one restrictions because I believe the city council has to vote to actually take us out of them because we have to be above 660 for long enough and then the decision is made. So still stage one, but at least the prospects are looking better right now in terms of the aquifer level. Rain chances, ooh, no, not looking all that promising. Uh, slim to none, about a 10% chance on Sunday. Tuesday and Wednesday, we're back to about a 10% chance. And that's about it. So we're looking at a few opportunities of some stray showers. I like the visible satellite imagery today, and you'll especially notice right here in Northwest Bear County. Notice those lines that form. I believe those are that's a little bit of wave activity from the wind blowing right over the hills in the hill country. And once you get past the hills, past the escarpment, then you get sometimes those little parallel bonds forming in those clouds. So kind of neat to see that. Anyway, otherwise very quiet other than some rain just lingering earlier today in far east Texas. And now that rain is moving through the southeastern United States, all of course associated with the remnants of beta. High temperatures today all over the place from 72 in Dallas, 76 in Austin to 96 in El Paso. You see the big temperature spread west to east as a result of the clouds holding tight in East Texas and nothing but sunshine as you get into West Texas. Locally around town, 83 in San Antonio was our high, 93 in Catula and a sunny 94 for the high temperature in Del Rio. But you get east of I-35 here, LaGrange only made it to 78 and Gonzales topped out at 76. Right now we're at 79 in San Antonio, 78 New Braunfels, but still 90 degrees farther to the west. So big temperature differences if you're traveling along Highway 90 this evening from San Antonio westward, you'll notice the changes along that route just pretty quickly here too within an hour. Dew points, we're all feeling a little bit of mugginess. So dew points are well into the 60s and these aren't going to be changing anytime soon until we get to about the middle part of next week when prospects are looking good for a cold front to affect us. And that of course would sweep away the humidity and call for some much cooler mornings. But that's about seven days from now. Wind is out of the north. 
but it's lightened up quite a bit. It's pretty much going to be calm later on tonight. I don't think you'll be noticing it after sunset. So let's talk about forecasts tomorrow morning, 7 a.m. 59 in Fredericksburg and Kerrville, so some upper 50s in the hill country, but a good chunk of South Texas in the mid 60s, including San Antonio. Then by the afternoon, back in the low, low, maybe even mid 90s along the Rio Grande, 83 Gonzales though, and 88 in San Antonio. You get to Bernie 83 tomorrow afternoon, Randolph area 86 and Elmendorf. 87 degrees. So temperatures are creeping their way upward a little bit back up to about 90 on Friday with sunshine. Lower 90s likely this upcoming weekend and then into next week. There's that the prospects of a cold front. I think the odds of a cold front are likely. It's just the timing and its exact impacts are up in the air. All right, we'll wait and see. Thanks, Adam. Our case at Q&A with Mayor Ron Nuremberg after the break. It is Wednesday for today's KSAT Q&A. As always, we are joined by Mayor Ron Nirenberg this evening to talk about some of the biggest issues facing our city right now. Let's start with COVID-19, Mayor. We have seen the numbers heading in the right direction. We see that we are in the safe zone this week. Are you feeling any relief right now? Is Are we at that point? Uh, I, I wouldn't say relief. In fact, I think we're, we're a ways away from relief. Relief will come when I think that there is a clear path to um, eradicating this disease, and that really comes from a vaccine. But I do feel that, you know, all the work that we've been doing over the last several months, the uh, very deadly July and August that we saw has uh, shaken up this community to a point where people are taking this very seriously. We do know that the virus is still out there. The transmission positivity rate is a six and a half percent. That's not where we need it to be for schools to safely reopen at 100 percent occupancy. So there's still work to do. Uh, clearly, uh, we have come down from the worst of it in August, but we also don't want to see it spike back up again. So relief or, or um, you know, happiness from these numbers is not what I would describe. I, I would say that I'm, I'm pleased that we're back in control and I want us to stay that way. Did you have fear, though, that Labor Day would be, uh, you know, another rise in the cases? I mean, from that perspective, you know, are, are you satisfied yeah, with what you've seen? Yeah, I mean, we, we, we certainly brace ourselves every time there's a new stage of reopening or there's a major event where we know there's going to be congregation. So uh, we are in that zone right now where we're watching the numbers very closely from the Labor Day weekend and the reopening at low levels of occupancy of schools. We've got to watch those numbers for the next uh, five days or so to know that we really, you know, we, we absorb the impact of that. We have seen a little bit of a bump, uh, but it clearly has been uh, manageable. And, and again, we want, it to, we want to keep it that way. Let's talk about a big issue that we discussed with you last time last week when you were here. Uh, your call for a review on SAPD's body cam policies. We have since then seen another person be shot and killed at the hands of officers. Where are we in that review and how are you taking in this information that we've seen another deadly incident involving police here? You know, it's it's tragic and it and it again illustrates the fact that we have uh, another epidemic here in Bear County that we've talked about for a number of years. Uh, in addition to the pandemic that we're, we're experiencing, the epidemic of domestic violence and, and, and the involvement of guns in those situations. You know, I've noted many times uh, over the last six, seven years that virtually uh, every call that we hear about in a dangerous situation is a call for domestic family violence. And this is another one of those cases. In fact, all of the last three cases that have gotten attention have been domestic violence calls. Uh, they, do, they are serious, and when there's a gun involved, they become even more serious. Clearly, uh, this is uh, another tragic event that deserves uh, close scrutiny. Uh, it is under investigation. It will be for some time. Um, but, you know, again, I think it illustrates how severe and how complex our challenges as a community with regard to, uh, you know, violence of any kind, but in particular, intimate partner violence. 
We talked to an attorney from the Texas Freedom of Information Foundation on Monday during the segment. Uh, he talked about the fact that the city of Dallas has committed to a 72 hour rule unless there's extenuating circumstances where 72 hours after an incident, they will release body cam footage. Is that the kind of timeline that you're looking? Are you talking to the, uh, the police chief as it goes through this as well? Is that the kind of timeline that you're looking so people know when to expect some of this? I prefer um, disclosure, early disclosure of that kind of information, because look, there are cameras everywhere. And usually what we see first are cell phone videos of incidents. Uh, body cam footage is um, a form of evidence. It is uh, a, a very, very much part of our system of accountability. And I think the public needs to be part of that. That said, we do need a policy. And that's what I've asked for the city attorney, the police department, our city management and the council to review together, uh, that information is being collected. We need a policy to govern uh, when that is and under what circumstances the, that footage is released. So the public has clear expectations, as do we, uh, but we can also respect the investigation process. Um, when there's a criminal investigation, for instance, that is referred over to the, to the district attorney. Uh, we wanna make sure that we don't um, compromise uh, 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 an investigation that could lead to that should lead to justice. We're going to take a quick break, continue our conversation with the mayor right after this. Continuing our conversation with San Antonio Mayor Ron Nuremberg, and I, I want to just say one more thing about body cam footage. I, I know people that the minute you say we want to see the body cam footage, they think there's some anti-police you know, agenda behind it. That's not what we're talking about here. We're hoping that to, to people at home can make up their mind about what they see. Yeah, absolutely. This is about um, accountability. This is about a, a disclosure, transparency, making sure that we have uh, the adequate information so that everyone can, um, you know, interpret the facts the same way or that we have the same facts to work with. Otherwise, uh, there's hearsay and, and there's, um, you know, there's disruption and, and discord, and, and that's what we're trying to ease. And, and body cams were uh, put in place for that reason. Let's talk a little bit about another big initiative coming the way of voters here in just a 40 days or so. Uh, in terms of tax initiatives here in town, you have spent a lot of time uh, preparing this plan in order to shift money that was used to go to fund the Edwards Aquifer Protection to now workforce development and then later transportation. We are seeing people uh, come out in opposition of that. We heard from a very familiar face earlier in this show, your former mayoral rival uh, in opposition of that. Why are you still backing this? Why do you think that money does need to be moved to workforce development and then down the road transportation? So, number one, uh, to be clear, the Edwards Aquifer Protection Program will continue. The city council already voted to uh, approve its new funding mechanism that will that will begin uh, through our normal operations. This is not a new tax. This is not an increase in tax. What this is is a recognition that we have 150,000 of our neighbors, families, who are struggling to put food on the table as a result of this pandemic. We are in a bona fide emergency. And the workforce initiative is to help people get back to work, get back to work and, and jobs that are available right now that require uh, credentials that they will be able to obtain through this job training program. Uh, this is about ensuring that um, the, the place that we call home, where so many of our families are struggling as, as a result of job loss and income loss from this pandemic, are able to get back to work, get back on their feet. Uh, there's not a, a more important cause right now than us than, than for us to rally around our neighbors in need. Mayor Ron Nuremberg, as always, appreciate your time on a Wednesday. We'll see you on the night beat tonight. Sounds good. Thanks, y'all. We'll be right back.
Good morning to you. It is Wednesday, September 23rd. Antonio Fire Department says a dryer likely caused a house fire on the southeast side. Firefighters responded to the call around 2 this morning in the 1700 block of Ann Arbor Drive. They tell us the family living inside that home, they were all able to make it out safely. After an hours long meeting, the Texas Historical Commission voted and they decided not to move the cenotaph at the Alamo Plaza. The proposed move was part of a larger years long plan to renovate the area around the Alamo. And first and five, we have breaking news on the search for 17 year old Sebastian Eduardo Vasquez Carpio. It is not good news. San Antonio police confirming today skeletal remains found in West Bear County on Sunday belong to Eduardo. The 17 year old disappeared on Friday. Two days later, a body was found inside a burned stolen car in the 6600 block of Calle Duarte which the medical examiner identified as Eduardo. The shooting happened around 645 last night at the 9800 block of Petrenko. Police telling us that officers found Carvajal dead behind the wheel of his car and multiple shell casings nearby. Surveillance video shows a man driving away from the scene in a dark colored SUV shortly after that shooting. Right now, police are still searching for the person responsible. So a 44 year old man shot dead by San Antonio police officers last night. Officer were responding to the northwest side apartment complex where Sanchez lived for reports of a burglary. Investigators say officers tried to get Sanchez to drop the gun, but he pointed it at them and threatened them with a rifle. Six officers then shot him. <laughs> We're back to a sunny stretch here in the next several days. All the way through the upcoming weekend and into the early part of next week, sunny and really predominantly dry, making it into the lower 90s eventually. But prospects are good for a cold front by about this time next week. All right. Thanks, Adam. And thanks for watching the news at 6 with us. See you back here on the Night Beat at 10.